Yes, sir. Um, yeah, Islam is such a beautiful religion, by the way. Um, Thank you so much. Myself, but I've, I've got a concern. Okay. Um, because it might seem like an obvious question to the Muslims, but as a non Muslim, I'm quite confused. You're welcome, just ask. Um, it's about Prophet Muhammad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, um, because when I ask my Muslim brothers and sisters, they tell me he was perfect and of no sin. I don't know how true that is. But if it's true, then how are human beings uh, supposed to be related? Because my definition as a human being is, if I'm asked to define a human being, it's someone that is actually prone to mistake and to learn from how they can evade those mistakes. Yes. So if he was perfect, then how, how am I supposed to relate to someone that I feel wouldn't understand the position? I must say that is one of the best questions I've ever received. Okay, and I'm not trying to just, uh, uh, you know, be nice. I, I sincerely mean it because that suggests that you're thinking uh, in a certain way that will lead you somewhere. And a lot of people don't give so much attention to these details. And to answer your question, let's just say that within Islam, the Islamic body of scholars, this is a debatable matter whether the Prophet Muhammad or Prophets in general were sinful or not. The position that I personally adhere to is that Prophets were sinful as well. And therefore you are able to relate to them. However, because they are meant to be examples for people, the type of sins which they engaged in can never be any of the sins which regular human beings engage in. So you still relate to the concept of feeling guilty and then seeking God's forgiveness as a prophet. So now we emulate the prophet in that behavior of his. And that's why our prophet Muhammad used to tell us, he said, Oh people seek forgiveness from Allah because I do so 100 times a day. Why would he do so? So this is a matter, a ma a matter of cleanse, cleansiness, clean, cleansing oneself and one's soul. The type of sins the scholars define them as doing that which is not the best. Meaning, there could have been a, bunch, a number of options and the Prophet does that which is not the most ideal. This is how they viewed the sinfulness of the Prophet. Not that he would engage in fornication. Because let's say, if a Prophet engaged in fornication, then he told the people, do not fornicate. Do you think the people will abandon fornication or they will fall into it? It will become very difficult for them to stop because they say, well, the Prophet did it. But you will tell them, yeah, the Prophet did it and he repented. They will say, okay, so I will do it and I will repent. Do you understand? So that has to be something that the Prophet cannot even possibly engage in. Otherwise, it will open the door for the people to say, well, I will do it and I will repent as well. So there, there's a sinfulness which is not, the, not doing the best option out there. Which happened with the Prophet Muhammad, for example. The Prophet Muhammad was once sitting with the, uh, the, the elite among the people of Quraysh. He was trying to target the, let's say, the, the influential people in the society and trying to preach Islam to them. While he was engaged in this activity, a blind, poor man from among the regular Muslims came seeking his advice. All the Prophet did was, Abasa. This is a verse in the Quran, in Surah Abbas. He frowned and he turned away. Now, the, the, mind, the man is blind. So if you frown as, at a blind man, does he see you? Did you offend him? No. But Allah wanted that even that, because it's a prophet, and the prophet is not supposed to do that, Allah mentioned that in the Quran and taught the prophet to avoid doing this in the future. This is another evidence about the authenticity of the Qur'an. Because if the Qur'an were to be authored by the Prophet Muhammad, that would have been the part he would leave out. Where it's criticizing him. Yet this is from Allah. He has to, he has to convey it. He conveyed to the people Allah reprimanding him by telling him, Abasa wa tawalla. He frowned and he turned away. And ja'ahu al-a'ma. When the blind man came to him. وَمَا يُدْرِيكَ لَعَلَّهُ يَزَّكَ Then the continuation of the verses. So this was a situation where the Prophet should have done something better in the sight of Allah and he didn't, so Allah automatically corrected him. The scholars say this would be how the Prophets would sin, not like, you know, committing, uh, drinking alcohol or committing fornication or killing an innocent person and so on and so forth. So is that, is that good? Thank you so much, man. Good question again. Okay, thank you. Awesome. You're welcome, sir. Um, this question says, 
I believe in Allah, but I find it difficult to live according to Islamic rulings. Is belief not enough? Uh, well, look, you know, it's, a, it's very difficult to answer that question because belief is enough. However, if that belief was genuine, then it would have an impact on you in regards to your actions. That's why we see in the Quran, Amanu wa amilu salihat. Yesterday, Shaykh Baptism was mentioned uh, the ayat in Surah at teen right? ثُمَّ رَدَدْنَاهُ أَسْفَلَ سَافِرِينَ إِلَّا لَذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ فَلَهُمْ أَجْرٌ غَيْرُ مَمْنُونَ Except those who believe and do righteous deeds. So Allah put these together for a reason, because that faith in God will lead you to do good. However, it does not mean that you will do all the good and leave all the bad. No way. So we are sinful, we fall into sin and so on and so forth. So that becomes a matter of whatever Allah wants to judge us by on the Day of Judgment. Allah might overlook and forgive our sins even though there are many because of a good deed we have performed. So when you say you believe in Allah but you have a hard time living by the rules of Islam, I need to ask you further questions. Does that mean you do absolutely nothing? You don't pray, you don't fast. You do everything that is, you know, every prohibited act and you leave alone every good act, every obligatory act. If so, then you have to question your belief now because that is the belief of Satan. Satan believed in Allah. And he's going to hell forever. Because belief in a sense that he acknowledged the existence of Allah, but that did not lead to obedience when Allah told him to prostrate before Adam. So we have to question now, what do you mean by belief? Is it acknowledgement? Acknowledgement will not save you. Belief has to affect you. Has to affect your behavior. If you're doing some good, falling into many sins, then you're still in the area of you know, safety, but you have some remarks. And those, I cannot pass any judgment. No one can pass a judgment. It, it depends on Allah on the day of judgment. But we say we're playing with fire. So we should avoid being like that. And of course, when you do good and avoid sins, then those will naturally bring more goodness and will help you avoid more sins. So it's a process. Just be patient, inshallah. Now. No, no, it is not a bad quality to ask someone to praise you unless you are a human being asking others to praise you. Yes, I would agree that this is an issue with human beings among, among other human beings. But when it comes to the creator of human beings, then this is the ultimate perfect request from the creator. Why? Because we are so heedless, if we are not told to do something, we just don't do it. We forget about it completely. Furthermore, I will give you the difference between thankfulness and praise, because there's, there's a connection between the two. If someone gave you coffee, do you praise them or do you say thank you? You say thank you, even though you may praise them. If you saw someone give someone else coffee, do you thank them or do you praise them? You praise them. Say he's a generous guy. Did he give you anything? No. Have you ever even, uh, what is the ringgit? The lesser than the ringgit? Sen. Who? Sen. Sel? Sen. Cell phone? Sen? Sen. Sen? Cents. Like dollars and cents? Oh, okay, that's cool. Cents. He didn't even give you a cent. Yeah, but you know, the guy is great, man. He ha he's brave. He's, uh, he's kind, he's respectful. He hasn't done anything to you. You praise him. Thankfulness is conditional to usually receiving something. Praise is when someone has qualities that make you speak about them even though they never asked you. So I would say even if Allah didn't ask us, at the end of the day, we have in our form, in the way we created the urge to praise him. Because he has all the qualities that deserve praise. And so, we praise Allah. Thank you, Allah. Thank you very much. Another question would be, if God is self-sufficient, why does he need our worship? Yes, let me correct the question. When you say God needs our worship, where did he get this idea from? If Allah needed our worship, 
Don't you think he would have removed the free will from all of us? Made us all believers who are engaged in worship throughout the day. Because he needs it. When do you need something? Without it, you can't survive. I need to eat, otherwise I'm going to starve. I need to go because I'm running late. You need something when it, you, you can't do without it. If Allah needed it, he would have imposed it on us. But he doesn't need it. Therefore, he gave you the free will. Even if none of us worshipped Allah. Is, he, is, is it going to affect his majesty in any way, shape or form? No. And Allah told us this in one narration through the Prophet Muhammad. He said, oh my servants, oh my creation, if all of you, if all of you were to be as righteous as the most righteous man in the world, it will not increase my dominion and majesty in anything. And if all of you were the most evil, like the most evil man in the world, it will not take away from my majesty and dominion anything. Allah doesn't need any of that stuff. So there's no need of worship. There's the offer to worship. And when you worship your creator, you elevate yourself as a human being. When you don't worship the creator, you will wind up worshiping something else. And you will wind up taking yourself down. There's no way around it. Everyone who doesn't worship Allah is worshiping something else. Whether they acknowledge it or not. It could be their ideas, it could be themselves, it could be anything. But it's not the one that deserves to be worshipped. So Allah does not need worship. He offers it to us. We take it and enjoy it. Thank you, Basically, the next question says, can you just explain again why there is a day of judgment? Yes, I explained it the other day and I'll be happy to explain it again because if there wasn't a day of judgment or if they weren't a day of judgment, then a lot of evil people would have gone away with a lot of garbage. And that's not fair. I, I as a human being who is uh, for justice, I refuse to believe that there's no day of judgment. I'm speaking from a completely logical point of view. Even though, even if I weren't Muslim, hypothetically, and I am. Even if I were to take religion aside completely, I don't even want to discuss religion right now. I'm speaking from a human being level. If you told me that you get to beat five people in the class and you get away with it without accountability, I will refuse. If you beat five of my children, somebody came and beat up my kids, and they say, Oops, sorry, nothing you can do about it. There's no accountability. There's no one I can, there's no judge, no lawyer, no one I can say, hey, hey, man, what's up? This guy just hurt my children, hey, sorry. Or the best you can do is hit him back. So you go beat up his children. Then his son shoots your uncle. Then your uncle shoots the cousin. And then what's going on? There's, that's the, you know, the only way you could fix it, by just taking it right back. It wouldn't work, man. At some point, you would run out. At some point, one will be oppressive. They just come and bomb the whole family. Now you can't take revenge back. So they wind up oppressing you more. Now who's going to hold them accountable when it's all said and done? It wouldn't make sense if there wasn't a day of judgment where you can come and say, Hey, that's what happened to me. This is what I did to others. And all these things will be evened out through retribution. There has to be retribution. It's the most logical thing in the world. We accept it everywhere. How could we not accept it in the life to come? Thank you, Abosal. The next question says, how true is the claim that Islam was spread by the sword? Huh? How true is it? Okay, all the Muslims with the sword, pull it out. <laughs> Here's my sword. Oh, I can see better now. Right here, man, if we, wanted to, if we wanted to spread Islam by the sword, we would have all brought our swords and hid behind the door. And as soon as a non-Muslim came in, we were just ready at the door. Bam! Chop off his head next. Come on, don't tell him. Don't let him see. And just have a massacre over here. Kill everybody. Say, all right, Islam was spread by the sword. We communicate Islam to everybody. Look at him. Dead on the ground. Come on now. Wake up and smell the coffee. That I drunk already. And drunk is the right, uh, drank, I'm sorry, yeah. I have drunk. If you say I have drunk, it doesn't mean you're drunk, by the way. It's the right tense for have, when you use have, the past participle. I don't know why I'm saying this right now. But, <laughs> because though sometimes I say this and the people are like, uh, Muslim, drunk? Wait, you have drunk this before? They, their mind shifts to drinking alcohol. No, I have drunk the coffee. Correct, it's a correct tense. But, um, yeah, so we have, Islam has not spread by the sword. Now, I cannot sit here and lie to you and say there was no war involved in Islam. That would be another lie. 
Absolutely, there were many wars within Islam and the spread of Islam all over, whether Muslims were the attackers or the ones being attacked. Okay, but then that was the case with so many other ideologies and religions. But war was not the focal point. War was part of the process that was inevitable. And it was never means for someone to enter into Islam. It was never means for someone to enter into Islam. What happened is, because Allah decreed that the religion has to be permanent. Okay, let's just be very factual here. So, based on the line of sequence of events. We mentioned prophets after prophet after prophet. Scriptures were distorted. Prophets passed away. We don't have any footage of Jesus. We don't have any footage of Moses. We don't know anything. At some point, one final prophet will be sent. His message must be preserved. And the followers must exist. If the non-Muslims decided that we Muslims are annoying people, let's eradicate all the Muslims. And war was not allowed in our religion. We were not allowed to defend ourselves. Then the non-Muslims, and they tried, they could have come and killed all the Muslims, and then people will no longer have the message of Islam available until the day of judgment. So Allah made it a point that the people and Muslims and the religion will remain available. Even if that required that when these Muslims are being attacked, they will pull out the sword and then defend themselves. Or that they had to reach out for the rest of the world, so then that was part of the process. That does not mean that any Muslim ever said, you believe in Allah or I'm going to kill you, because you, I said earlier, can you force belief on someone's heart? So the sword is not going to fix it. The sword is never going to fix it. So don't confuse the fact that they were, there was warfare by saying that that was means for Islam to spread. Islam was spread through the communication, the preaching of the message, and more important, the example of the good Muslims that they left and the impression they left on non-Muslims. The merchants who used to go around and be honest in their dealing in their business. The people were impressed. This is how Islam came into so many countries. And it remains to be until now. Another side point. If Islam was spread by the sword, then how is it that we still have Jews and Christians in so many Muslim countries that coexist? By now, 1400 years into Islam, don't you think we would have finished them off already? I mean, come on. Especially now with, you know, uh, weapons of mass destruction and all times of advantage. You could have killed everybody a long time ago and we'd just be running this earth on our own, just running around Muslims only. Hey! <laughs> No, 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 says, hey, hey, let's party. Drink coffee only, no alcohol. <laughs> but it doesn't happen. I mean, we're living together. So no, it wasn't spread by the sword. In fact, if anything, we were exposed to the most swords in the world. Check history. Check, check the, you know, the missionaries and the, what, the crusaders. I mean, these are facts. The Philippines. The Philippines was a Muslim country. It was a Muslim country. And the Crusaders forced Christianity upon the Muslims of the Philippines. Only Mindanao maintained and held strong, so they remained to be the way the Muslims are. But, you know, the rest of the place, they just they went with it, which is okay. But these are facts. I mean, I'm not picking on the Christians, but do realize that this is something that happens. And Muslims are always being exposed to someone forcing their religion upon them. More so than we are accused of forcing our religion upon others. So it's just part of history. And it doesn't make us a violent people. Again, I've said it many times. We're not allowed, we are not allowed to kill an insect. You know an insect that you find in your house, unless it is going to harm you, you're not allowed to kill it in Islam. If it's an insect that's going to infest your, in your rice and ruin your, your food, then you're allowed to kill it and you're not allowed to burn it. But if it's not going to harm you, if it's a moth, you can't just see on the mouth and smash that thing. It's forbidden in our religion to kill a butterfly or a moth for no reason. You can't hunt for fun. If you're not going to eat that what you're hunting, you're not, you're not allowed to hunt either. I mean, this is how much we value a soul. The soul of other creatures, trees, let alone another human being, whether he is an atheist, agnostic, Christian, it doesn't matter. We have no right to spill this person's blood in our religion. No right. The Prophet Muhammad explicitly said, you will remain within the margins of this religion until you spell, spill illegal blood. 
Once you kill one innocent soul wrongfully, you are on the verge of entering the hellfire. You're giving up on your religion, on Islam. I don't care what people do in the name of Islam. It doesn't make it right. It doesn't. We are, we're not violent as people are making us appear to be. Are there violent Muslims? For sure. These violent Muslims are killing Muslims, by the way, more so than they're killing non-Muslims. In the name of Islam. It's a crazy thing. But these are sick people. I'm not responsible for sick people. These brothers are not responsible for sick people, nor are these sisters. So you see a hijab, you see a beard, don't stereotype and put us all and paint us with the same brush. It's, it's impossible. It's not fair. And we, we never spread it by the sword. No. You think we have a question? I mean, really, after all, he has like 800 questions on him. He says, I think I have a question. You got to stop. <laughs> yes. yes, sir. Allah says in Surah al that Kullan Nuritu Ha Ulai Wa Ha Ulai Min Ata'i Rabbik Wa Ma Kana Ata'i Rabbik Mahdua. Nah. So you mentioned in your lecture that God, God's love is conditional or not unconditional. So can you, can you please clarify this point? Thank you. Yes, sure. Now, of course, you didn't translate the ayah, which is known that, that uh, putting the speaker on the spot and assuming that I know the ayat and the translation, which, <laughs> alhamdulillah, I do. No, no, I do, alhamdulillah. I'll, I'll spare you the headache, even though for future, I would say, because you could have cited something that I don't know, and therefore that would be like, whoa, you know what I mean? Especially for Muslim to a Muslim, you're like putting on the spot. Or for another speaker. So we should always, if you want to ask a question, where you're citing an evidence, at least translate it. So that the people understand. If I didn't know the I'm like, what are you talking about? And how do you translate that to English? It's going to look very bad. But alhamdulillah, by the grace of Allah, I know exactly the ayat. And I would like you to quote the context. Sorry. Sorry. Before that, he was talking about uh, people of Jahannam and people of Jannah. Okay. Okay, allow me to now translate so everybody can be on the same page as we are. So Allah Azza wa Jal is speaking now about the choices human beings make, right? Man kana yuridul ajilata, whosoever wants this hasty life, ajalna lahu ma nasha'u liman nurid. We will give him as much as he wants to whomever we will. Let's say you only want this worldly life. You only want the villa, the Mercedes, the beautiful wife or the beautiful husband, the nice children, education, uh, express visa, what do you call it? American Express and all the nice stuff. That's it. That's all you want. You are not interested in anything else. You don't want paradise. You don't even care about anything else. Allah says, whosoever wants that, we will give this to certain people as much as we want. No problem. Huh? Liman nurid. ثُمَّ جَعَلْنَا لَهُ جَهَنَّمْ يَصْلَاهَا مَذْمُومًا مَدْحُورًا then, then, when it's all said and done, we will send the same person to the hellfire. And he will have to now deal with it in humiliation. Why? You made your choices, buddy. You, didn't you want that? You got it. You weren't interested in the life to come? Now you got what you want? Don't come on the day of Jesus and say, Oh, by the way, I also want paradise. Because if you wanted paradise, then you should have made that choice back now. وَمَنْ أَرَادَ الْآخِرَةَ huh? And whosoever wants the life to come وَسَعَ لَهَا سَعْيَهَا And he strove for the life to come. You have to make some effort, man. You're not just going to walk there. وَسَعَ لَهَا سَعْيَهَا Then فَأُولَٰئِكَ كَانَ سَعْيُهُمْ مَشْكُورًا Then those, their striving will be appreciated. Then comes the ayah, right? Then Allah says, Allah then said, and now we will give both groups as much as we want from the giving of your Lord. And no one can restrict whatever Allah wants. Meaning you cannot tell Allah, don't give Obama more. <laughs> if Allah wants to give Obama more, give him another presidency or Trump or Pump or whatever these guys are, I don't know about them. <laughs> Yeah, it's none of my business. If Allah wants to give him something more, else for, I cannot stop it. You can supplicate all you want. If Allah doesn't want to accept that supplication, then Allah is going to give him whatever he wants. You have no control over that. You cannot tell him what to give or not to give. So Allah told us that based on our choices, brother, Allah will supply each accordingly. But then he's telling you, make the right choice. So you'll be supplied with what is good. Does it answer your question? No? 
Okay, Zakalakh. No, no, yes, yes, that's the new one. No, 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 yes, 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 yes. Notice I said four no's, five yes, so it's a yes. Sheikh, arham ahlak ya Sheikh, khallina namshi liyom. Kamal ya Saif, Allah yaatik al afi. My brothers recognize and all the sisters right there, sisters. <laughs> Alas, ya Sheikh. That one, that one, that one, and that one over there. The one with the pink hijab, the one with the blue hijab, and the one that just walked in five minutes ago. Hey! Hey man, what you doing? Listen to the lecture or checking him out. Anyways, I'm just I'm just teasing you, Akhi. I know. He's, he's a good brother. Just just pulling your leg. Yes, sisters. Sure. Yes, uh, it is an assumption on my part that when you look at the image of a deceased family member, you would feel grief. One may argue that no, when I look at that person, I find hope. Sure, that becomes a subjective matter. But usually, they, I would say, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I'm just basing on my experience and then maybe you can relate to me or not. Even though you might get hope, but grief is there. Simply because that person exists not anymore. They're no longer in your life for you to enjoy their company and so on and so forth. So the grief, I think, over, overcomes and it, it supersedes the hope, which is definitely there. You might be inspired and so many things, but at the end of the day, the overwhelming feeling might be sadness because now there's so much potential that you could do with this person that gave you hope that you don't have access to anymore. So I would argue back, in my own personal humble opinion, that you will still feel grief. You get some hope, and then you get some grief. And it's better sometimes that you forget. Because you can still get that hope without the image. But looking at someone and reminiscing on certain moments is a saddening experience. At least in all movies, that's how it is. In experiences of people, I've come across the same thing. But then, yes, it's an assumption on my part. If it doesn't apply to all, then, you know, it doesn't apply to all. Good, good observation. So this question says, Dear me, it's a follow-up question to the Islamic script, the, the Soviet question. Ah, okay. So it says, Dear me, that Umar ibn Khattab, when he spread Islam to other countries, between brackets, by a sword, there was no pressure on non-Muslims to convert. Egypt. No, can you say the first two words? Dear me, what? Do you me. Do you mean? <laughs> what kind of accent is this? British or American? Do you mean? No, do you mean? Okay. No, well, well, let me tell you what I mean. I'll explain myself. I like that anyways. Sorry, say. You have the toughest job in the world, man. If I were you, I'd quit. Try to do this instead. Anyways, no, look. I, I said it very clearly, that's why I see I'm, not, I'm the type who doesn't, personally, I don't, I don't lie when it comes to religion. I say it as it is, and then if the people understand, two thumbs up, if they don't understand, too bad. It's not my job to change or twist anything for the people to become happy and clap for us. I said, war has been part of Islam. I never took that out, did I? I said it explicitly. However, it is not the objective. The objective was the availability of the religion globally. There was no internet, there were no phones, there was no way for Islam to reach, for example, Africa or India or any other country on Australia on the other side of the globe unless Muslims were present. 
So the message of Islam was to spread. It was not with the sword. However, it was in the following order. And that I didn't elaborate on earlier because I don't want to give another lecture for each question. But now that it's here, I will say, the command of the Muslims was that when you go to this other country, you invite the people to Islam because you need to be available in all of these countries. However, it, there's no fighting involved. Okay? If they accept Islam, alhamdulillah, through the good preaching, through the message of one God, which is supposed to be universal and agreeable to all mankind. If they said, no, thank you, we are not interested. I'm a Christian, I'm proud of being a Christian, I don't want to be a Muslim. No problem either, and no sword either. So the second option was what is known as paying taxes. Okay, the Muslims will have to be in charge because this is the religion of God. Again, we're always on the point that this is the true religion of God. It has certain rights and power that others don't, they don't enjoy. Bottom line of things. So now you can live under our protection. Mind you, the taxes that the non-Muslims paid ensured their protection, security, and the availability of their temples and places of worship. Meaning we didn't throw away their church and say you can just live here but you cannot worship. Everything was allowed to remain the same. However, it had to be, this is outside the Arabian Peninsula as a disclaimer. However, they were allowed to remain but now you pay in taxes to the Muslims. If somebody wanted to attack these non-Muslims, it was the job of the Muslim army to protect them. Because they're paying taxes to the government. If they refuse the first option and they refuse the second option, then the only other option left is that you want war. You don't want to accept and you don't want to surrender because of the power. There's a presence of power. So now if a country wants to invade another country, they can try to do it peacefully. Say, look, you guys have nothing, no tanks, no airplanes. We got everything. So if you want to be just, just accept, let us manage this business. If you say no, we refuse, we, what, then what's going to happen next? You're basically asking for war. Right? Isn't that what happened between certain countries? They wanted to invade them. They said, no, I'm mean, asking for war. So then war was established. Now time out. Time out. Just in case your mind is going there. Let me tell you what warfare is in Islam. The instructions of the Prophet Muhammad were as such. No house was allowed to be burnt. No tree was allowed to be burnt. No livestock were allowed to be killed. No women were allowed to be touched. No women were allowed to be killed. No children were allowed to be killed. Any religious figures among the other people, from religious figures, priests or whatever you call them, no one was allowed to touch them. The only people Muslims were allowed to fight with were soldiers on the battlefield who said, we're not going to surrender, we're taking this to the arms. So then we, they were allowed to fight with those people. And as Allah says in the Quran, if they incline towards peace, then go for peace. Because it wasn't about spilling blood. It wasn't about counts of bodies like people do today. It was about maintaining peace. Why? The religion had to be available. That's it. And you will find that in most of these cases, the people willingly entered into Islam. And they enjoyed the rulership of the Muslim rulers who were very just, as mentioned yesterday by the Shaykh in his lecture. Justice was established among everybody. Today we have lost it, unfortunately. So it was never about the war, but war was part of it. Every country in the world is entitled to have it. Why do they have armies and marines and navy? Why? I would say if somebody argued, well, well, wait a second, the fact that you have weapons it suggests something. So oh, then let, tell your country to throw all their weapons in the ocean. And then when the neighboring country wants to invade, tell them, here, slap me on the other face, on the other cheek. Do it. Do it. You're so benevolent. Tell them, come invade our country. We're just going to be chilling here. No problem. We will not fight you back. No one in the world does this. But when it comes to Islam, oh, look at the Muslims. Excuse me, buddy. What is this double standard? If it's okay for you, it's okay for us. But we have at least guidelines and some decency. We don't know bomb no milk factory, people in the wedding, people in the funeral. I mean, people are already grieving over a dead man. They bombed them and killed the wedding. This is crazy. This is never allowed in our religion. So we have some etiquettes of war. Today, people have war with no etiquettes. But then they want to point the finger at Islam. That's nonsense. I hope that answers the question.
The question says, it is often said that women are oppressed in Islam. How would you respond to such a claim? Wait, wait, let me throw something at a sister. <laughs> Bam! Look at the oppression we're imposing on our fellow sisters. What, define oppression. I want to understand, um, who is the questioner? What do you mean by oppression? Do you consider covering oneself oppression? Okay. Isn't it part of the fashion that when you are having your wedding, you wear a particular type of clothing and you wear this, I don't know what they call it, the women? Oh, they're, they're, where's the oppression? It's her wedding day, she should be naked. <laughs> I mean, why not? She's going to be with her husband in the room very soon. Might as well be ready for the occasion. What's all these clothing you're putting on? Oh, such oppression to the women. So, Akhi, this is, this is the way they want to do it. Let them do whatever they want. It's woman's thing. Let the woman do their thing. So in, the fact that she's covering herself cannot be equated with oppression. Otherwise, I would say it's oppression to pierce your ear twice. <laughs> and to pierce your nose and to put a tattoo on your forehead and to, I don't know what. And to me, this is oppression. Uh, oh, it's okay for a woman to do all that. But if she wears a hijab, then that's not okay. What's up? This is, just a, a sub, this is a, a personal issue now. You cannot say her covering herself is equal to oppression. It's not like she has all her male family members with, you know, nine millimeter guns standing at the door before she goes out. Put on that hijab. <laughs> now I'm going to catch you right down the street and pop it. <laughs> the sister's willingly in her bathroom for six and a half hours fixing the little tiny little bit stuff, you know. Okay, six and a half minutes. <laughs> she does it willingly. Nobody's oppressing her. This is her choice. Someone to show, someone to cover. This is their choice. We can say that uncovering is oppression. Uncovering is oppression for the woman because now she's being misused by all these beasts among us men who see her as nothing but a piece of flesh. That's oppression. Sorry, but that's our perspective of oppression. She's being oppressed because they cannot sell any item in the market without a naked woman, including cars. You want to buy a car? They throw a lady with a bikini on it. What, is she part of the engine? <laughs> when it breaks down, I just use her head and I say, what the heck, man? I'm buying a Corvette. I don't need no naked woman with a bikini on my car. You go to all these car shows. It's always naked woman with bikinis hanging. What the, am I in the right place here? Is this a strip club or is it a car show? No, but if they don't bring naked women, people don't buy cars anymore. And then I could tell you this is oppression. And I'll be right when I say so. So now you think this is oppression. I think this is oppression. Who decides? God. Not me and you. We will never agree. According to God, it is not oppression. It is protection. It's protection. And truth said, no matter how much you hate the Gulf countries and so on and so forth, bottom line is you cannot even suggest that the rape ratio or the rape percentage in these countries is anywhere near the United States where every nine seconds a woman is raped. These are not my statistics. These are their statistics. These are reported rapes. Reported. Meaning some go unreported by family members, by molesters. She's too embarrassed, whatever the story may be. I'm not saying that they're bad, but the reality is because there's so much flesh going on and so many men have no control. No, he can't get a girl. He's tried, go out, and then the bottom is, look, I'm getting something. I don't care how it's done. And they go and hurt somebody. That, that this does not happen frequently in the countries where the Muslim are covered. Because that will already lose interest. The man who is a rapist is uninterested in a covered woman. By default. Why? It's a surprise. It may not be what he's looking for. You know? He takes off, ew, what the heck? <laughs> Turn me off, I don't even want to rape you anymore. So he's going to go, oh, okay, I see everything over there. I know what's up, I know what I'm getting. I know it's a bad example, but really, a rapist is not going to be messing with no hijabi ladies. She's just, already she's off the track. He will go after the one who may be innocently displaying herself. I'm not saying that the women who you know, are not covered, they're saying, okay, let me go out and make sure that some rapist likes me. No way. 
She doesn't want that either. She may be innocent. She wants to enjoy her beauty. She's beautiful. She feels beautiful. She wants to look good, no doubt. But the bottom line is, the man doesn't understand that. He doesn't understand that you're trying to beautify yourself for yourself. In his mind, you're doing it for him. That's men. They're sick? Okay. Call them that. Unless they have a religious commitment that restrains them? Yep, that's how it is. So that's it. It's just a means of protecting the woman. When she goes to paradise, she doesn't have to wear hijab anymore. That's it. So she earned her paradise. We have to earn our paradise as men. So many things we would like to do which we cannot. And so many things that are difficult to do, we have to do so we can earn our paradise. That's, that's the obligation of male and female. Different obligations, but obligations. There's resistance, there's uh, you know, friction, surely. But that's, that's, the, that's the test. For the woman, because of her natural beauty, a woman is, the body of a woman by default is, is better than the body of a man. You know what I mean? No, you don't know what I mean. You don't have to know what I mean. But that's just, this is her test. This is her test. So she has to go through the struggle. It's okay, you know. She earns paradise. She won't. At home, she doesn't have to do that. With her family, she doesn't have to cover up. And more importantly, with her husband, she's supposed to uncover. With her husband, she's supposed to go that extra mile because that's her lawful husband. So now, she, you know, no hijab, none of that stuff. Makeup and the whole shebang. And, you know, have a blast. <laughs> Women are not oppressed. So, this question says, what about the people that live deep in the jungle who have never heard about Islam? <laughs> do they die as, if they die as a non-Muslim, do they go to that fire? Deep in the jungle. <laughs> they weren't just in the jungle, they were deep in the jungle. <laughs> Meaning someone reached the beginning of the jungle, but they couldn't reach them because they were deep. Oh, let me see, that's deep, man. That's We'll just give da'wah to the ones in the front. The ones who are deep down there, let's let them go to hell. No, actually it's interesting you ask this question because Islam has a very fantastic answer for this one, which the Prophet Muhammad shared with his nation. And that is that individuals who never received the message will be tested on the day of judgment. Now usually the day of judgment is the day of judgment. You get judged, you don't get tested. But because these individuals were not exposed to the truth, their test will be delayed until that day. And the hadith is in, collected by Imam Muslim in a Sahih, and it was narrated by the Sahabi Al-Aswat. And he said that those certain people who didn't receive the message, either they were deaf or they, were, they had Alzheimer's, some sort of reason where the message wasn't communicated. And then the supporting ayah is in Surah Al-Isra, وَمَا كُنَّ مُعَذِّبِينَ حَتَّى نَبْعَثَ رَسُولًا Allah says, we will never punish anyone until a messenger is sent. Meaning if you don't receive the message, you're not held accountable. So those individuals will be tested on the day of judgment. If they pass the exam, it will be a summary of what they would have done in this life. They will go to paradise. If they fail, they will go to hell. So whatever test they have then, would be what they would have done in this worldly life because Allah doesn't oppress anyone. But they will not go to hell directly because they never got the message. That's unfair and Allah is never unfair. Nor will they go to paradise directly because they haven't done what they, sh they should do to earn it. So they will be tested accordingly on the Day of Judgment. Now. Okay, thank you, Mousad. You're welcome. Any questions on the mic? Question. Okay, I read. Another question. The question says, can you please explain to me the concept of concubines at the time of the Prophet? Why is it a sin? Why is it not a sin when it is sleeping outside the book? Who decides what is a sin and what is not a sin? When you say, because this is really strange, you're using the Quran to say that sleeping outside of wedlock is forbidden, yet the same source told you about concubines and now you're rejecting it. So either you accept both or you reject both. If you're going to say that sleeping outside of wedlock is forbidden based on the Qur'an, then based on the Qur'an, the concubines were made as an exception. And if, you, you know, there's no way around it. So this is now you playing around with the religion. I advise you not to play around with the religion. 
Now, that leaves a very big question because some of you are like, what? Concubines? Right hand possession? What are the Muslims doing? Say time out before you freak out. That wasn't meant to rhyme, but it did. Look, the way the world functioned then and then the progress until today is as such. Whenever there was warfare, whenever a country invaded or defeated the other, the general rule is that the property, the, whoever, the property of the defeated country become the possession of the invaders or the victorious one. That's just how the world functioned. Don't get mad at us because of how the world used to be. If you have a problem with that, then you should raise that issue to David and Solomon as well. Because they had concubines. This is something that is related to prophethood as well, just so you will understand. So the way the world functioned is that there was this type of situation. Mind you, it was not based on racial differences. It was not white people, black people type of thing, ownership, as happened in, in, in the history. This had nothing to do with race. It was that when this, when this country owned the other one, they became the, the property. So now you have a, a lady whose husband might have died in the war, whatever the case may be, now she's on her own. And she became the property of this other family. These are facts, not Islam, not Islamic. These are historical facts that happened during the time before Islam and throughout Islam. Now when Islam came, some may suggest that it should have eradicated that altogether, tooth and nail. However, Allah decreed that that concept is not completely eradicated, it remains. But it was regulated in such a way where people are not taken advantage of, and then it is not misused, and that the many, many sins in Islam, the expiation for them was the emancipation of that own person. Because basically it was human beings owning other human beings, not based on race. So now what happened was, you have this lady who's living in the household of this man. There are two scenarios. Either he marries her, which he could, or that she lives there and she is a foreigner to this man. She is a foreigner to this man. So Islam allowed the man to protect himself in some ways and the lady from being able to have relations with this woman even though she is not his wife. And that was stipulated by the creator. You will find that people that object to that are the same ones who don't mind that a boyfriend and girlfriend have sexual relations together. Even though this according to all religions or Abrahamic religions is a sin. So now you're telling God that when he regulated something in a particular way, made it an exception to the rule, you, you are displeased with that. However, you are pro-fornication, pro-adultery, you have no issue with it according to the way human beings are living now. So you tell God what he made right is wrong and what he made wrong should be right. The only, this issue is one of the most difficult ones for people to comprehend, I understand. But I would say the only reason some might not understand it is because they lack the foundation upon which they can comprehend such data. And if you remain to be at odds with this idea, then I take you back to my previous suggestion, create your own heavens and earth, create your own creation, and do not allow concubines to be the possession of the man. Don't allow it. To you, this is bad. In your system, it is not good. Go ahead and do it. If you cannot do it, then conform. Conform to the facts. This is the fact of the situation. Now, of course, if she had a child, she is automatically freed. She is automatically no longer a concubine. So there are certain rules and regulations to that relationship, which Allah allowed for the man and for the woman for their own well-being. Otherwise, they would fall into fornication. They would fall into fornication because they are coexisting in the same house. Because that is a high probability, there was this outlet. But it was made in such a way that it is phased out. 
Islam didn't eradicate it, but it recommended the phasing out of this fact of life that existed pre-Islamically. It was not Islam that introduced it. Otherwise, the same person who objects, unless this person is completely non-religious, the same person who objects should object to David and Solomon. Say, why did you have three, how many according to the Bible? 700 concubines. Solomon, 700. Go object to him. And object to his God as well. If the Prophet did it, and that was something that was done with the Prophets, then who are you now to come and raise an issue about something that God allowed the Prophets, let alone regular people? Say, so you don't know God then. You just don't know and you need to learn who your creator is and you need to learn that his wisdom is beyond yours. While you are hurt, you might be hurt because of a certain thing in this whole equation that is not clicking in your brain. It is actually a good solution in the long run. Similar to that is four wives. You could argue as well, why is a man allowed to have four wives? I mean, come on now. A woman has to share her husband with another dude? With, oh. <laughs> Wait, sorry. Slip of a tongue. Alhamdulillah, that doesn't happen. She has to share her husband with another lady. Tell any, any sister here, how do you feel about that? If you like the idea, give me one thumb up. I thought so. All this is like, Meh. not me, I hope. Not my husband. It is something that they don't like. Why? Because naturally a woman does not want to share her husband. And so she is pro, you know, one man for me, only for me. Nobody else should be in his life. Sure, if we were to look at that fact of life from the sister's lens, we would all agree. I would say, sister, I feel you and I feel with you. And yes, your husband should stick to you only and see nobody else, marry nobody else. But... If you look at it now from another lens, you would realize what type of issues may arise from having this type of society. Where each man has one woman, when we have surplus of women versus men in terms of numbers. In wars, men die. In, on, on average, men die more than women. So now if every man married one woman, how many women will remain with no husbands? So many of them. So what are you going to tell them to do? Fornicate? Or live the life of celibacy for the rest of her life? She doesn't want that. She needs a man in her life. So then Islam opened the door for that to take place. So that these sisters are looked after. Let me give you another benefit in wisdom. How many wives cannot stand their husband seven days a week? Some may love him. And some of this guy is just a heavy weight on my shoulders, man. And if he were gone for three days, I'll be a happy camper. So then we say, okay, sister, if he's too much for you seven days a week, here, take some time off. So some ladies are actually happy because there's less friction, less argument, less fighting. He's, he's dividing his time. Plus, now when he's around, you know, there's more appreciation of each other rather than being at each other's necks. So in some cases, this is a solution. Okay, a woman is barren. She does not produce. You want her husband to dump her? Who's going to marry her next? Does she really have to wait until some guy who also doesn't want children come around? What are the chances? It almost never happens. Every man wants kids. So now Islam, instead of dumping this wife like some, she's some you know, sick thing, she's not. It's the, it's the decree of God that she doesn't have children. For wisdom he knows. She, is allowed, she stays with her husband and now he gets to marry another one so he can have children and still look after her. And the benefits and the wisdom are endless. And if I were to give a lecture about the benefits of having a concubine, it would be similar. You might agree, you might disagree, I respect that. But I'm just trying to highlight the fact that if you look at it from a very narrow angle, you cannot, you cannot even conceive it. How can it be okay to have a concubine? I don't care what this guy is saying. Even if the other answers were good, I'm not buying this one. I understand. But I'm telling you because you're looking at it from a very limited scope. If you broaden things and you look at history and facts, you will see that everything Allah decreed is wise. Raped? No way. No, no, no violence or none of that stuff is allowed. 
It's, it's something that should be done willingly. If it's not willingly, then it's gone. I'm good to go. Okay, thank you very much. Oh no. <laughs> that was a trick. Did you mean go or can continue with the question? With the question. Okay, yeah, go ahead, sir. <laughs> so there is a follow up question. It says. Uh, about the same topic? Hijab. Okay, good. Regarding your defense of hijab, there are people who cover themselves but get raped. There are sisters in hijab who get raped. Okay. So there's a guy with a bulletproof who got shot and died. Don't wear bulletproof vests anymore. <laughs> Seriously. The police officer wears a bulletproof vest when they're out in the thing because one of them got shot in the head or it went under his armpit. I don't know, somehow missed the vest and two died, three died, five died, a hundred died. So now there's no point in wearing the bulletproof vest. Khalas, now just go out and die, you might as well. <laughs> what kind of logic is this? Did I say that women who are wearing hijab don't get raped? It's impossible. Imagine if I said, everybody gets raped. <laughs> At some point in life. huh? No, of course. We're just talking about the risk. The higher versus the lower risk. Otherwise, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. But by default, covering reduces the chances. In countries where Muslims are covered, the rape is less. Statistically speaking, that's it. It's a fact. So, you know, it doesn't mean that because some are raped, so there's no point wearing hijab now. So it's almost like saying, look, you're going to get raped anyways, so just take it off. <laughs> so, come on. Okay, thank you, Wilson. This question says, is God fair or just? Then it says another question, unfair because we are from different origin. Then the third question Different is, what? Region? Origin. Origin. Yeah, then the third question says, some people are rich and some are poor. Oh. <laughs> oh, let me cry. So I'm assuming this is a poor person who's upset that others are rich. Nothing else makes sense. Why is that? What do you consider fair? What is your concept of justice that we're all, uh, imagine? We all look the same. Huh? We speak the same. We act the same. We have the same amount of money in our pockets. We drive the same car. Same. What? Define that. Because if someone had a Mercedes C20 and another one had, I don't know, C21, then you could, I don't know if these exist, by the way. I'm not a big car fan. I have my old GMC. Then someone can argue, well, you know, God is not fair because his Mercedes has an extra cylinder in the engine. So now there's never any fairness or justice if you're going to make us all equal. We're not all equal and that does not entail lack of justice. It entails distribution. There's a matter, a matter of distribution. The overall concept of distribution is fair in the sight of Allah. But for each individual, it doesn't have to appear to be fair. Because what you think, and that's why Allah says in the Quran, very clearly, وَعَسَىٰ أَن تَكْرَهُ شَيْئًا وَهُوَ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ Perhaps you might hate something and it's good for you. وَعَسَىٰ أَن تُحِبُّ شَيْئًا وَهُوَ شَرٌ لَكُمْ Or perhaps you might love something and it is bad for you. وَاللَّهُ يَعْلَمُ وَأَنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Allah knows and you don't know. That is the underlying principle behind this. That you might want something and you want to be rich. You want to be rich so bad. But if you were rich, you would be spoiled. You would be, you'd be arrogant. You would be a brat. People will not even stand you. Whatever, whatever. It could be bad for you in the long run and you might end up in the hellfire. And because you're poor, you are humble and agreeable and easygoing and what have you. And vice versa. Someone might be rich and they want to be poor. If they were poor, they may be the most annoying beggars in the world. You know, some beggars are really annoying. So God made them rich to suffice them. And when, you know, rich, it's usually never the case where a, poor, a rich person wants to be poor. But I'm just saying... The bottom line is this is all subjective. It remains to be fair within the realms of the creation, not in your eyes, because that each one of us has his own yardstick of fairness. You know, and, and bold, you go to Turkey. I've been to Turkey, right? So I, I'm a very hairy guy only on top of here, right? Just so you want to. I'm very hairy. And my hair grows in three hours. You see how I shave now? Tomorrow morning you look at me, it would look like I've had you know, for hair for two days. I went to Turkey, <laughs> uh, all these people were having this, uh, all these Arabs who are going bald, were in Turkey getting an operation of implanting hair. 
they had this weird thing around their head and they had this red, black and red, uh, you know, fuzzy looking, it just looks so weird. And I was looking around everyone like, this is amazing. I'm struggling every day to be bald. And these guys are paying a lot of money to have hair. So we're not satisfied. I could say this is not fair. Why can't I be naturally bald so I would waste, you know, less time in trying to shave? I could just have a shiny little skinhead. But, you know, that's just my perception. And for them, it's the other way around. Human beings, you cannot judge this, this fairness. I could say this is not fair. I would say no, it is fair. God gave me what he knows is best for me. And my thing, now I have to shave, that's my business. I don't sit there and accuse Allah of injustice because I like to be bold and I'm not, and he likes to have hair and he's not. So he had to get an operation, I'm trying to get a laser operation to get rid of my hair. It's just our own percep you know, perception of things and God is beyond that. Okay, thank you, Abonsal. Basically, the next question says, um, if God is different from human beings, how do we fully understand the qualities of Allah that are abstract, such as love and hate, etc.? Does, the, does he love differently than us? Yes, of course. Everything about Allah is unique to him. Every attribute of his is unique to him. We might share some aspects of it, but our aspects, are, our, our, uh, ours are limited, deficient, and created, and his are unlimited, undeficient, and uncreated. So we are seeing, we see, Allah made us see and hear. And Allah is the all-seeing and all-hearing. But our hearing and seeing are deficient, you cannot hear everything, obviously. You cannot see everything. And yours are created. And they're controlled by Allah. Whereas Allah's seeing and hearing are uncreated and they are limitless. They have no limitations whatsoever. So just like Allah Himself is unlike His creation, His attributes are unlike His creation. Therefore, the love of Allah is unlike the love of His creation. And it's oh, how much do you understand that? As much as Allah allows you. And as much as He revealed. That's it. You stick to the revelation and you understand the revelation. You can never comprehend the majesty of Allah in his full sense as a human being. It's just, but you will learn enough to get by, which, which is what he expects of us. What he revealed is all you need to know. Anything beyond that that is, that is unique to him, it's not your obligation to know it to begin with. So don't even sweat it. Yes. Okay, thank you. This question says, I have a question, sir. This question says, I have a question, sir. <laughs> okay. You said earlier that, I, that if I ask an idol to create anything, it won't be able to do, to do so. However, from the questioner's perspective, this also applies to Allah. If I ask him to create an ant, I don't think the ant would just appear. Well, obviously, because we are speaking about an idol that exists physically in front of us that you're saying has special powers. So you're saying this particular object is at your disposal. You're asking it for things and therefore we expect it to be able to create. Whereas when we speak about Allah Azza wa Jal, we're not speaking about an idol whom we issue commands to and then he executes. That's a completely different thing. Plus, if you want to look at it that way, let's just go anywhere where an ant is being created. You see the difference is very simple. Allah told us he's the creator. He made that claim. And then he allows us to see in his creation the manifestation of his creation. Did this idol make the same claim? No. So therefore you cannot compare the two. If you want to see Allah's creation, don't wait for me to tell oh, Allah create an ant for this guy. Let's go see where an ant is coming into existence from, where do they come from? Uh, eggs or something? I'm not an expert in biology or science. Eggs, right? So one ant lays a lot of tiny eggs and then the when you go see that, when you see the vegetation grow, when you see the sunrise or the sunset, you're seeing the majesty of Allah. Who He told you He does that. Did your idol even speak to begin with and tell you, I do it? No. So what are you comparing the two for? It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Nice try though. <laughs> Thank, you, Thank you very much. This is the third follow-up for the hijab and rape situation. Wow. So it says, regarding the hijab and rape situation, isn't beauty a perception? One person might be attracted to an unhijabi, revealing person, hence, promote, hence promoting rape towards the hijabi. Well, one person might not be attracted to an unhijabi, but attracted to a hijabi, so promoting rape to hijabis. I mean, I think from the failure of the question, it's, I mean, 
Yes, yes. There are exceptions to every rule. I agree with you. That's why the people have fetish. You know, fetish people like to smell feet. Generally, smelling feet is abhorrent. Some men are satisfied with sniffing some women's feet. This is their fetish. We say it exists. These people are selected all over the world. They love feet. They have websites for this. And you just look at it and say, wow. Now what the heck is going on here? I mean, feet stink by default. But they like feet. Let them like feet. Some like to be tied and beat with a stick and spanked and all types of stuff. That's their fetish, man. And this is weird. So if some guy has a fetish, oh, a hijabi woman, that's my thing right there. So what, how am I supposed to become responsible for this freak? This is a weird guy. This is, let him mind, there's 20 like him, 100 like him, ya yeah, sheikh, 1,000 like him. The rest of us don't feel this way. So Islam came to deal with the general people, not some exceptions to the rule with people with fetish and people with weird stuff. Okay, thank you. Most of the questions, do we have any questions on the mic? I'm sorry, let me ask for a Okay, we don't. So the question says, if we gain Allah's love only by being righteous, how about the story of the prostitute who felt a dog and entered paradise? Sure, I never, we never denied that. We said it's all in the hands of Allah. It's all according to Allah. This prostitute, according to the prophetic tradition, that there was a prostitute from the children of Israel, who obviously, I'm not going to tell you what she does, because the name says it. And one time, she had no good in her, in, you know, except what she believed. But one time she saw a dog, which was on the verge of dying from thirst. And she, there was a well there. So she went into the well and she used her uh, leather sock or something and she gave this dog some water. And the dog drank this water and survived. Allah forgave her and admitted her to paradise because of this one good deed. If someone says, how come we say, look, do you want to replicate that? The only option, if you're objecting, say, okay, then does that mean that this is, okay, you want to become a prostitute, and then go look for a dog, and then give the dog some water, and then say, okay, I've done the same, so now I'm going to paradise. No, but would you be guaranteed the same forgiveness from Allah? No, because do you have the condition of her heart at that moment? No. So these are all from the matters of the unseen. What the lesson behind this is, don't despair from the mercy of Allah. Don't despair. We didn't say you have to be the most righteous person to enter paradise. You could enter paradise by doing some good deeds that are so valuable in the sight of Allah that will forgive all of your book of sins. But does that allow me now to give you all a green light to commit as many sins as you want and hope that your good is going to eliminate the bad? No, that's a very risky situation. So the general default methodology of reminding the people is encouraging towards good and avoiding sin. While some might do the opposite, they might be forgiven by Allah, but I cannot take the risk on telling you try that. Cannot take that risk. So we're not exempting those people from being forgiven by Allah. We have the hadith that someone will come on a day of judgment with that many sins in their books, scriptures, scribes of, of, of sins. And then only the statement of la ilaha illallah with its implications will be placed on the other side of the scale and it will outweigh everything. But can you say this to everyone now? Brother, you say, La ilaha illallah, khalas, go ahead. Get a girlfriend, get drunk with her tomorrow, commit fornication. You say, La ilaha illallah, don't worry about it. The hadith says that on the day of judgment, a man will come, blah, yeah, sheikh, no. Because if he winds up in hell, then who are you going to blame? Who is he going to blame? That's a big risky thing. Say, no, 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 no. Yes, the hadith exists, but would I, you and I, you know, get that privilege? I don't know. So what is the safer thing? No, leave all that stuff alone. So we say, leave it alone. We have questions from Mike. So there's two more questions in front of me. So the question says, do I have to be a alim, meaning scholar, to gain faith and trust towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? No. Can you repeat the question? Do I have to be a scholar to gain faith and trust towards Allah? To gain faith and trust towards Allah? No, you don't. But obviously the more knowledge you have, the better your chances. Knowledge is key. Knowledge is light. And people that have knowledge are able to see more so than those who don't have knowledge. Do we make it conditional that everyone knows everything to be able to reach that point? No. But it's, it's something that we should strive for. Yes. Because the Prophet Muhammad encouraged that we acquire knowledge. Every type of knowledge. Not just religious knowledge, even though that is the most important. Muslims being knowledgeable in all fields is for the betterment of the society. 
It's, it's good that we are good in so many different things. Not to misuse them, but to use them properly. No. Okay, your role, so I think this is the last question. If you don't have any question on the mic. Wow. Amazing. Okay. How do I beat depression? You grab a stick and you beat it to death. <laughs> Bam! Told you. I don't know how you beat depression. You need a psychologist. Psy psychiatrist, I guess, or whatever they call them. No, I mean, depression, I can tell you how to beat it from an Islamic point of view. Um, and basically, it has to do with your remembrance of Allah as a way of life. And the fact that you, you see, it's your belief in Allah and the belief in preordainment and decree. People become depressed when they fail to understand the reasons behind the events that take place. If you understood the wisdom behind them, it kind of soothes you to some extent and you're able to cope with things better. So when, for example, when you know something, when you've been warned about something and it happens, you, you react much better than when it gets you by surprise. People usually don't know how to react when they're surprised completely, when they're caught off guard. But when they, they are notified about something taking place, they cope with it better. So I would say if someone understood who Allah was, how decree works, how the preordainment functions, then they will be less depressed because they have an understanding of the wisdom of Allah. When they don't know all of these elements, then they get depressed over things that happened in the past. I mean, it happened in the past, you just have to move on. Allah decreed that it happens, so you know, you can't beat a dead horse. It's done, it's over. What is the other example? You don't cry over spilled milk. I mean, you spill the milk, so you're gonna cry over it for the next three hours, or you're gonna clean it up and buy another carton of milk. I mean, realistically speaking, if you're gonna cry over the milk for days, then everybody will tell you you're wasting your precious time. Just deal with it and move on. So understanding that, look, God decreed this milk is spilled. So, all right, it's all good. You move on. If you don't understand why it happened, you start freaking out and wondering why, what did I do, what did this? Then you get into the state of depression. I don't know if that answers, but that's, that's what I can think of right now. Uh, so, also, I will give you the pleasure of concluding. What's with this conclusion every time? <laughs> I mean, I gave an hour and 30 minute lecture, another hour 30 of questions and answers that I have to conclude after all this. You have been dismissed. <laughs> How about that for a conclusion?